Good morning. Well, thank you guys. It is great to be here. And uh, normally I'd say I, we don't want to take up too much of your time. We know we got to get back to class, but I know you got vacation to get to. So uh, I understand the priorities, which is kind of exciting. Um, I want to do this. So I do want to take a few minutes and just talk about what this is really all about and what we're doing and why Nashua, you guys are really kicking off something uh, that we're going statewide with. Um, it, and it's, it's, it deals with a lot of different issues, right? So Kati is here and she's going to tell this really incredible story. Uh, it's a tragic story. It's an amazing story. It's a hopeful story. Um, uh, and it's one that, again, every, the, each time I've heard this story and I've read this story, uh, she's gone to the point where she's created a graphic novel on this story, um, it hits you in a different way. But let's talk a little bit about what's happening in the state and, and why we're doing this here at a school. We could, do, we could have Kati come out and we could talk about some of these issues uh, anywhere. But it's so critical that we do this in the schools, and I'll tell you why. We invest money in schools, we're doing new programs, we have our career academies and our governor scholarships, we're doing student debt pay down, all these things that we talk about. And these are all really important pieces of the puzzle. Um, I'm a big believer, I think as a lot of, a lot of folks know, that when, and I think a lot of folks would agree, when you invest your time or your money or your effort here at this level, what we're really doing is trying to set a stage of opportunity um, for not, five, not just this year, but five and 10 and 20 years down the road. It's so critical, right? And one of the biggest pieces, you could do all this stuff, but at the end of the day, I'm a huge believer. None of it matters if we cannot solve what is, I believe, the biggest problem that we see, not within our schools, but in our entire culture, our entire society, which is simply respect how we treat each other, right? That thing we call empathy, practicing empathy, right? We talk about mental illness, we talk about drugs, we talk about all of these things. These are all just symptomatic of a problem that we've let grow, and you guys are experiencing at a level that has never been seen before. It's never been seen before. I, I'm the first governor in, in decades to come up through New Hampshire schools. I'm very proud of that. I grew up in Salem, right down the road. Um, but it was never anything like this. And now I'm a dad, and I have an eighth grade daughter. I have a, my son is a freshman, uh, and I have a first grader. And just taking off my governor hat and just putting on my dad hat, I'm scared to death. <laughs> I am. Just as a dad, I am scared because I know the pressures, the anxieties that is really hitting this generation like never before. And, and one thing I try to do is I look at the whys. Why are we here? How did we get here? And I have to be very blunt. My generation screwed it up. We completely screwed this up, right? We had the amazing opportunity and I, when we invented social media and the internet, and boy, did we screw it up. We completely took for granted the value of personal connections, right? And it, at the end of the day, I'm a huge believer, it comes down to those personal connections. Because with personal connections, you're understanding what empathy is about. You're li being an active listener. You're understanding what your friends are talking about. You're engaging with other people that might be strangers. You're having dialogue. You're talking to people that might completely disagree with you, but it's completely respectful. And then social media came along, and I think it's like the bane of human existence. I use it, don't get me wrong. I think most people do in one way or another. But we somehow thought it was okay to treat people like garbage if we weren't looking them in the eye, right? We thought it was okay to be disrespectful and to be angry. And what happened was, over, over a period of years, we lost the sense of being tolerant and, and knowing what tolerance was all about for ourselves. And so we lost a bit of resiliency there. So I guess the real message is, uh, my generation completely screwed it up, and I hate to tell you this, you guys got to fix it. And, that's, and, that, and I really mean it, right? I'm not saying it, not every, we all have responsibility in it, of course, but your generation, and I mean this with every bit of my sincerity, your generation is the one that really needs to help fix this thing for the long term. And we're seeing great signs of it, right? You know, we have the millennials and the Gen Zs. I don't know if you guys are Gen Z. I can't keep up with the next name or iGen. Is that what they're calling you guys now? Right? But the generation that has come up with this, that is kind of living with this interaction with media, I mean the news, who watches even watches the news? I don't even have, I watch, we, we, we download, we stream TVs and movies in our house with my kids. I don't have cable TV in my house. I won't have it. I don't want that news. Right? It's so negative. A bunch of people yelling at each other all day. You think that doesn't impact you? Even if it's not about you, you're seeing how people interact and that has somehow become the norm. 
So what we've really done is we've really, at a state level, I can't, I can't pass a law to make people nicer to each other. I can't pass a rule. I, the government cannot solve this problem. It's really a cultural problem that every single person, 330 million Americans, need to stand up and start taking charge for. You're the generation we're counting on leading it. That's just the way it is. And I'm sorry to, to give you that responsibility and that obligation, but that's also an incredible opportunity, an incredible opportunity. And that's exactly why we're starting this series here. Now, one of the toughest things I go through as governor, one of the greatest things I go through governor is also the toughest. I spend a lot of time with people just here listening to stories. What is your story? A mom loses a daughter to drugs and opioids. Uh, a, a, an adult can't get their elderly parent into a nursing home because they, have, they get a barrier with mental health services and our system has completely broken down, right? Stories of tragedy. And, and again, you the, my job is to take those stories and say, okay, where did the system fail, right? Where did, we, where did we lose it? Where did we lose this individual? And then get the big system to focus on solving the problem for that individual. And if you're doing it for that individual, you're probably doing it for a thousand other people that you didn't get a chance to spend time with. But from a generational standpoint, we really need to fix this stuff for the long term. One of the, one of the most amazing people I've ever met, one of the most amazing is sitting right over here. But another individual, she's not here, and I, I've been traveling around the state with her. Her name is Scarlett Lewis. Scarlett Lewis, um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lose it. I get emotional when I talk about Scarlett. Scarlett's son was murdered in, in the first grade in his classroom in Sandy Hook. Tragedy. A mom knowing that her son was just gunned down. And from that, you could not blame an individual that had gone through that to just believe in the despair and a lack of hope, Right? You can't blame someone, because that is an unfathomable tragedy. But from that, she took and said, well, I not only do I want to make sure this doesn't just happen again in a school shooting or whatever it is, but she took it beyond that, and she created this program. It's called the Choose Love Program. It's going all over the state. And what it does is it just says, look, we're going to change the culture. We're, going to, we're not going to have a class on respect. We're just going to change the culture of how we teach all of our different um, subjects in our classrooms, and we're going to build in this model, and she created this whole program. And she showed it to me once, and I said, well, this sounds great, but I don't know if a school will do this. I have no idea. But I said, well, let's take it on. Let's see what happens. So we became the first state in the country to take on what we call the Choose Love program, which is a part of social and emotional learning. And different schools have different programs. And I thought maybe in the first year, 10 or 20 schools might get on board, and this could slowly catch fire, and teachers will start talking to each other, school districts will start talking, and maybe in a few years we'll, get, we'll start building it up. We are just under a year and a half in. 430 schools in our state have taken on this program. Nashua has been one of the leaders, and Nashua Elementary Schools and Middle School have been phenomenal with it. I'm blown away. What that really tells me isn't just the value of the program, but it tells me the yearning and the need for a program like this, for this kind of discussion, because people are seeing it, teachers, students, everyone is seeing it in their culture, in their classrooms, in what is going on in their communities. And so that sparked another one in me and said, okay, we got to keep piling on. When things are going good, I'm a big believer. Don't take it for granted. Put your foot on the gas. Go faster, right? And that personal connection that people make, not just with Scarlett and her program, but it's those stories. Look, Everyone has issues. Everyone is dealing with something tough, some tougher than others. But I've seen, if you look at suicide, you look at adolescent mental illness, it doesn't discriminate by how much money somebody has. It doesn't discriminate by race. It doesn't discriminate by where you live. Everyone is dealing with something at different levels. But that personal connection is so critical. I mean, the result, we know what the result is. It's drugs, it's violence, it's all these other symptoms, that we see, all these other issues that we see out there. But that personal connection, you are not alone. You are not alone. It's one of the most important messages that we can get out there. But you guys need to be, the, we, we're, we're talking about it. You guys need to be the ones that we start really trying to engage. And you need to teach us. How do we practice it every day? I'm, I, I'm, I'm one of the, the third youngest governor in the country. So I like to consider myself young. I know I'm not. I'm 45. I'm, I, I, I'm like, yeah, high school. It was like yesterday. No, it's not. And I know you look at me. I'm like an old man. I'm losing my hair. I get it. But what it tells me is we have to, we, this generation, even a younger generation of leaders or whatever it is, whether it's business leaders, community leaders, the governor, whatever. I don't know what's happening in the classroom all the time. I got kids and I don't know always what's happening. And that's why I get scared. And that's why we say, you guys got to tell us. We need to be the listeners about what's really happening. But in, in doing so, we also be, need to be able to raise people up that can tell their story of success, of going, the, the Scarlett Lewis's, the Cotty Preston's, people that go through amazing tragedy but say, I'm not gonna live as a victim, I'm gonna live as a survivor. 
And I'm going to spread this message and let people know that even through the most amazing circumstances, there are doors of opportunity that you don't even know are there. They are there. You've got to believe. It's, it's tough. But sometimes you've got to know there are so many doors of opportunity out there. We have this incredible economy. You can do amazing things. People travel more than they have ever done before, right? One of the hardest parts is convincing people, the students in New Hampshire to stay in New Hampshire because they have so much opportunity to travel the world and get jobs and do amazing things, right? So we're always competing with that. But knowing that, again, brings us back to what do we do to maintain those personal connections, those really important relationships that overall, I believe, start taking our culture where, where it really needs to be. So with that, I mean, I can go on all day. I know the governor's talking too much. I get it. Um, we have an amazing individual here. And when I first heard Kati's story, it, again, it just, it, it went, it just clicked for me in so many different opportunities. Um, she's a survivor. I'm going to let her tell her story. Um, 39, born in 1939. 1939, with an attitude like she was born in 1993. I mean, really, it was unbelievable. Uh, Hungarian, not just lived through the Holocaust, but experienced some of the most horrific tragedies. But again, through that, could have lived with hatred in her heart, could have lived without that resiliency, could have lived fighting all the time, every day, and you wouldn't blame her for doing that, but instead has found that hope, that positivity, and said, I want to spread that, and I want to let People know, especially young people know, that this is the generation that can really turn things around. Let's hope this, this little 10-year gap where prejudice and discrimination and all these things that we thought weren't there that are really there, they are there. Let's make sure that we bring them to the surface, but again, not in a negative way, but in something we can learn from and really embrace and something we can make positive. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to an amazing woman, Kati Preston. hear me? Yeah, well, yes, okay. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> uh, hold on one second. Somebody once asked me what's in the bottle. I told them it's vodka. <laughs> Anyhow, my name is Kathy Preston, and one of the reasons that I'm here is because I have been speaking in the last few years to a lot of people there are less and less people survivors of the Holocaust. And although I was not in a concentration camp, I was a hidden child, I was persecuted and I was hunted. And I tell my story because I don't want people to forget and I don't want people to deny it. There are still people who are completely denying it. You know, it never happened. Well, it did. It's the best documented genocide in human history. And I go around and I speak in schools and churches and colleges. I speak everywhere where people will listen to me. I don't like speaking in colleges on Monday mornings because they're asleep. And I, I really, I love schools. I mean, the, you guys are my favorite. And just like the governor said, he's kind of took my story from me. I love this generation and I will go into that a bit later. Uh, I come from a small town in, in Transylvania. You know where the vampires come from? Well, that, there's no vampires. The place exists, but no vampires. And I'm the child of a Jew and a Catholic. My mother was Catholic. My father was Jewish. And when they got married, it was a big scandal because people didn't intermarry. It was really shunned. And... Although my mother converted to Judaism, they were very sort of secular. They didn't really practice much religion. And I was always allowed to have a big Christmas tree, which was wonderful. And one day, one of the maids took me to the local church to show me the nativity scene. And I stole baby Jesus. <laughs> and I stuck him under my coat, and I went home with baby Jesus. And my mother takes my coat off, and she says, oh my god, they're going to say the Jews are stealing Jesus. This is going to be terrible. And I had to go back there. And they said, now you go back there, and you apologize to the priest. And I remember trembling. I was what, four and a half. I was trembling. And there was this very tall gentleman with a huge nose, like a toucan. And he was leaning over me with this bony finger, telling me I was going to hell for stealing Jesus. I never wanted anything to do with the church ever again. I was terrified. 
And at that point, my parents decided to get, get me a governess because they decided in their sort of naivete that to be a lady, you really had to have a governess. And my parents for those days were very well off. My mother was a dressmaker. They used to buy cloth in those days. People didn't buy ready-made dresses. And she had 40 girls working for her. It was a big business. And my father had a business uh, wholesaling fish. There was a river across the town. And he had great big crates of carp in the, in the river. And he was wholesaling them. And I remember as a child, there was always a carp swimming in our bath. We ate a lot of them, and I would go and talk to this carp as a child and say, look, I'm so sorry we're going to eat you, but you're going to taste so good. <laughs> and we did eat a lot of carp, and they really did taste very good. And then the governess came. Oh, my God, the governess. Oh, she was a bitch. She was terrible. <laughs> She, she, but on, on the other hand, she did teach me to read, write, and speak German in, in a mere six months, and that was quite a thing for a small child. But she was very mean, and I wasn't allowed to play with the kids on the street anymore, and I, she, she was a terrible snob. I had to hold my breath when we went past beggars. Although my father made me give money to beggars all the time, so I had to kind of run and give the money to the beggars without the, the, the governor seeing it because I was afraid that she would yell at me because I was breathing the same air. She was a terrible woman, and I hated her. And I kept complaining to my father, and I kept saying, you know, I don't like Fräulein, which means miss in German. He said, no, you have to because she's, she's a very nice woman, and she's going to make a lady out of you, and... It was, it, was, it was not a nice thing. And I loved my daddy. My daddy was really my, my, my favorite person in the world. Any of you girls who have that relationship with your father would know what I'm talking about. You know that feeling that you get when your father holds you in his arms, that feeling of love and security and peace. I never managed to recapture that. And my daddy was nice and tall and very handsome, and he always wore the very flamboyant scarf, and he laughed a lot. And I remember he smelled very good. He had this nice cologne, and he would throw me up in the air and catch me. And oh, I, I adored my daddy. And then slowly things started to change. You know, people said to me, well, why did the Jews agree to go to concentration camp? It, it wasn't like that. It was a progression. It was a slow erosion of our liberties. It was an erosion of our rights. Jews could no longer go to college. And then Jews could no longer go to high school. And the Jewish children could only go to Jewish schools. And I wasn't allowed to sit on my favorite bench in the park anymore because that wasn't a Jew bench. And we weren't allowed to go to the local swimming pool because we would contaminate it. And then the Hungarian authorities were very clever because they had all the Jews registered with the police so that everybody knew where they were. And they said it's for their own security. So they all went and registered with the police. So they had a list of every single Jewish person in the town to protect us, so they said. And then, of course, Jewish doctors were not allowed to treat non-Jews. And slowly, people started disappearing. Some of, some of the girls who worked for my mother disappeared because women under the age of 45 were not allowed to work for a Jewish family. So they were gone. A lot of the people who, who came to work for my mother were gone. The maids were gone. And then, of course, Fräulein was gone, which made me so happy. I didn't wash my hands for three weeks. It was great. She was a great hand washer, that woman. Apparently, she had this, you know, the cleanliness next to godliness, all that business. You know, she washed me all the time. Anyhow, I was quite happy when she left, and I was, I had a nice wild period of my life. And then this was the first time I came across real anti-Semitism. My mother came to me and she says, I have a present for you. And she brought this beautiful yellow star that she made out of gold material and put it on my coat. And she says, let's go get some pastries. And I'm going with her, we're going on the road, and she's holding my hand, and I'm hopping along. And a man comes opposite, and he looks at me, 
And I look up at him, sort of expecting something nice about my star, you know, beautiful star. And he spits in my face, and the spit runs down my face onto my star. And I look up at my mother and said, he hates stars, never thinking that it's me he hated. And my mother, who always protected me, just took me by the hand and dragged me home and shushed me. And she says, I'll tell you when we get home. Shh, come on, come on. And I was very shocked because this is not my mother, you know. And when she got me home, she says, no, darling, it's you he hates. I said, but why? She says, because you're a Jew. I said, OK, well, if I don't wear that, he won't know I'm a Jew and then he won't spit on me. And then she says, but you have to wear it because it's the law. I, I, I couldn't understand why, why this was happening. And at this point, the, they decided to build a ghetto. Now, you know the word ghetto is an Italian word. It means a foundry, a metal foundry. It comes from Venice. They had a metal foundry in Venice, an old one. And when the Jews li were living in Venice, they were allowed to be out during the day, but at night they had to stay in this ghetto. And that's where the word comes from, which has such bad connotations now. The Hungarian authorities built a great big wall, and they walled off a bad area in town, a small area, and they started to round up the Jews. And I remember there was a lot of screaming and yelling. I was looking out the window, and there were trucks and carts, and there were soldiers with whips and guns, and they were herding people onto these, these vehicles, and people were crying, and people were stumbling and falling down, and they were being kicked. And all this went on, and suddenly everybody was gone, and my father was leaving, and I remember him holding my mother and sobbing. He had a little suitcase next to him. And I remember worming my way between them because I had to be part of everything. And I was crying too, but I wasn't all that upset. I thought it would be like a business trip and he would come back and bring me presents like he always did. I wasn't too worried. But then there was silence, everybody was gone. And, and the streets were full of animals because when people were taken away so fast, they didn't have a chance to get any help for looking after their dogs and cats. And there were animals everywhere, hungry, crying animals. And I remember going downstairs and trying to feed these animals. And then the dog catcher came and took them all away. And that was pretty awful too. And so my mother decided to hide me at home. My mother didn't have to go to the ghetto because although she had converted, she was not considered Jewish. You were Jewish by blood. And even if you had one grandparent who was Jewish, you were supposed to go to the ghetto. And of course, being half Jewish, I was on the list. But my mother thought nobody would notice if one child is missing. And she just hid me in the house and I had to scooch under the bed every time anybody came. And I didn't like it because I wasn't able to go out. I wasn't allowed to go near the window. I had to be quiet. I couldn't run because people would hear. And then a woman came to see my mother. We used to buy our milk from a farmer. We, this young woman used to bring the milk on, with a horse and cart, and she would have the milk in a big vat at the end of her cart, and you would come down and she would measure out the milk and you would buy your milk like that. And she had been an orphan, and my mother made her a wedding dress when she got married. And she never forgot that. And when she heard that they're rounding up the Jews, knowing that my mother married a Jew, she came to see if she could help. And she said to my mother, where's your child? And my mother said, Shh, I'm hiding her. She says, no, 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 give her to me. I'll take her out to the country. And she can stay with me at my farm. And she'll be safe there. There's nobody going to come and look for her there. Nobody will think there's a child there. So let her come with me. And I remember my mother told me I'm going to stay on a farm, and I was so happy. I thought, great, you know, there's going to be kittens and puppies, and I'm going to be, have a great time there. And I hopped onto her cart, and I sat next to her on the wooden bench. She even let me hold the horse reins for a while. And we went for what seemed a long, long time, and we got to the side of her hill. There was a hill, there was a gate here. The, her house was up there, and as you went in through the 
the, the, the big gate, there was a small barn with a stall for a cow and one for the horse with a little attic above it with hay. They used to throw the hay up. There was no bales then. And she takes me out of the cart and she says, you're going here. I said, I'm going to your house. She says, no, no, you don't understand. You have to stay in the barn. And I said, why? She says, because people want to kill you. And you know, this idea of somebody wanting to kill me was very alien to me. I mean, you, you don't think of your death, do you, any of you? And I'm very close to mine, and I completely ignore it, because we don't think about that. Now, imagine a five-year-old being told that somebody wants to kill you. I thought, this woman is kidding. I haven't done anything bad. I'm a good girl. Why would anybody want to kill me? And I was being quite bratty. And she took me upstairs to this barn on these rickety stairs, and it was full of hay and big black spiders, and there were things rustling in the hay. And she said to me, you're going to have to stay here. And I said, what do you mean, on my own? She says, yes, because people want to come and kill you. And if anybody comes, you have to make yourself very small, stay very quiet, and hide. And I didn't want to stay there. And I started to cry, and I was crying and crying crying and crying. I wanted my mother, and I wanted my beautiful room, and I wanted my lovely bed, bed, and I wanted my toys, and I didn't want to be there, and I didn't want to be alone, and then it got dark, and the spiders were everywhere, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried for days on end. She would come and bring me food. She was a very nice woman, but I hated being there because I was alone. And I didn't have any friends, and I was sitting in this nasty place, and I didn't like it at all. And one day, I heard a commotion about, oh, early in the morning, and I looked through the cracks of the barn, and there were three soldiers in green uniform with black feathers in their hats. They were Hungarian gendarmes type, you know, the soldiers there. They were soldiers and policemen in, in one. And they were beating this woman. They were slapping her and saying to her, where's the Jew? We know you're hiding a Jew. We have information you have a Jew here. Where's the Jew? And they're slapping, slapping her. And she's bleeding from, from the nose and from the mouth. And she's saying, there's no Jew here. Go and look at my house. Go upstairs and look. And they all ran up to her house. And they ransacked her house. And they made a big mess. And they were throwing furniture out the window. They were really furious that they couldn't find a Jew there. And they came storming out, and they were going past the barn, and one of them said, oh, wait a minute. How about this barn? There might be a Jew in the barn. And I heard them coming up the stairs in their great big boots, and they had bayonets on their, on their guns. And they came up these stairs, and I scooched under the eaves and pulled the hay over my head and made myself really, really, really small. And I held my breath. But I was frightened because my heart was beating so loudly, I thought they would hear it. It sounded like a drum to me. And they started poking the bayonets in the haste, you know, throwing the hay around to see if there's anybody hiding. And one of them kept coming closer and closer. And I remember shutting my eyes, thinking, oh, no. And then I opened an eye, and I see a boot right next to my face. And then the bayonet comes down an inch from my face, and it gets stuck in the wood. And then he pulls it out and they left. And that's when I realized what it means to die. It means that somebody's going to come and put a knife in your head. And I stopped complaining. I didn't complain to the woman anymore. I was very quiet. I couldn't even stand up for a day or so because I was so frightened that my legs were not holding me up at all. And I was in this barn for over three months. And my mother was arrested because they realized that I was on the list and I was not in the ghetto, and they tortured her. She never told me what they did to her. She said it was too humiliating. But man she managed not to tell. And then they let her go, and she managed to actually smuggle my father out of the ghetto by paying somebody some gold coins. And my father was going to walk across to Romania to save himself. And he said to my mother, before I leave, I have to go and see the child. I don't want her to feel that I'm abandoning her. 
she, she depends so much on me. I'm going to come and say goodbye to her and explain to her that this is a war and she won't see me for a couple of years at least, but everything will be okay. I'm going to say goodbye to her. And my mother kept saying, don't do that, it's dangerous. He said, no, I'm not leaving without seeing her. And uh, he came late at night, he came to the farm. As he w walked towards the gate of the farm, he was arrested and he was deported the next day to Auschwitz. And he never came back. And you know, to this day, I feel, I feel tremendous guilt because I think maybe if he didn't love me, he, he wouldn't have had that kind of an end. But who knows? Nobody knows. And then my mother came to get me and she was so happy. She says, the war started and the Russians are coming and they're going to be very nice and they're going to stop persecuting the Jews and everything will be wonderful and you can come home now. And so we said a tearful goodbye to this wonderful woman, Elizabeth. And we went home, but the bombs were falling. So every half hour there was an air raid. So we'd go down to the cellar, then the air raid would go off again, and then we'd up and down. Eventually we stopped going to the cellar. We watched the war from the window because it didn't really matter. There were so many bombs. And the, the, the river across the street from us was frozen. And the Russians were coming down one, one embankment onto this side, and they were being machine gunned on this side by the Hungarians or whoever. And as they kept coming, and they kept coming, there were more and more coming across. They were holding arms, singing, coming across the ice, and they were being shot. And there were corpses built up so high you couldn't see the river anymore. And then suddenly we were under Russian occupation. Well. They weren't warm and fuzzy either, like my mother said, and we were starving. We were so hungry, there was nothing to eat. We ate a few old potatoes that were in the basement, and my mother and the women in the area were hiding in a double-walled bathroom because they were afraid of these soldiers who were running around abusing people terribly. And I remember that uh, they, the soldiers, I still remember the words they were saying, they, Davai Chas and Davai Barishnya, give me a watch and give me a woman. They loved watches, they had wrist watches up and down their arms. And they, they, they were after women, of course. And everybody was hiding, but they were very nice to children. And my mother decided to take things in her hand and, and, and go and talk to the local commander. And she dressed herself like an old woman. She blackened her teeth and she put something white on her hair and she put a pillow under her gray dress and hunched over pretending to be an old woman. And she went to see the local commander who to her surprise was a young woman. By this time the Russians had lost so many people that they were uh, promoting very young people for high positions. And my mother asked for some help and they she wanted to know, the woman wanted to know why, what would you need? And she says, well, you know, I'm a dressmaker. Come to my house and I will make her a beautiful dress. The young woman was in this uniform and my mother said, that uniform doesn't do anything for you. Come to my house. And the young woman came and my mother took a drape off one of the, the windows and made her a beautiful dress. And then other soldier girls came and suddenly we had food. We had lots of food, everything we had butter and everything and you know when you don't eat for a long time and you suddenly get food you get very ill because we were so used to not eating that we all got sick from eating again but everybody was eating like crazy because food was such an important thing and when when this happened my mother kept saying to the woman but we still can't go out can you get us a guard and that's when Ivan came. Ivan was about 17. He was a young captain and he had a sidekick, an old gentleman who used to play the accordion. And they were very nice to me and I was ill one day in bed. And I remember he came to me and he said, I have a present for you. And he brought me something in white paper and I unwrapped it and it was an orange which, thank you, Governor, <laughs> it, th this orange meant so much to me because when you've been starving, 
and I have never seen an orange before because we didn't used to import oranges. And when you're starving and somebody gives you an orange, it's a very big thing. And I remember peeling that orange and that wonderful smell of the orange. And I was only allowed to have it when I was sick. My mother candied it and I wanted to be sick all the time just so I could have the orange. It was wonderful. So every time I speak now, if I speak twice in the same school, I get an orange. And I always have an orange at home. It, it means something to me. And then the Russians left us. They went, and they went into a different barracks somewhere. And I just want to add that I've never seen a German Nazi. All the persecution in my, in my life was done by my neighbors, by normal Hungarians. I've never seen a German Nazi. They were all Hungarian Nazis, our own people. And then my mother said, we're going to the station because daddy's coming home. And I couldn't believe it. I said, oh, that's wonderful. So, so what's going to happen? She said, well, we're going to the station. There's three trains coming from Poland. And the people who survived the camps, why well, by this time we heard about the camps but didn't believe any of it. Uh, by uh, whoever is surviving will come home and we're going to see daddy. So we went to the railway station and we stood on the platform holding up a picture of my father, asking people, have you seen this man? 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 And we stood there until the train emptied and daddy wasn't on it and we started to cry and we went home crying. And then my mother says, well, he'll be on the next train. He'll be on the next train. Don't worry, he's not going to abandon us. He's coming. So we went back the next day, and we stood on the platform again with a picture. And there was no daddy. And my mother started to talk to these people who came off the train. And I was frightened of them, because they looked like ghosts. They, they had no hair, and they were in, in rags, and they were sort of gray and skinny, and they smelled bad, and you couldn't tell if they were men or women. They were sort of shuffling, and my mother started taking these people home and giving them baths and giving them clothes, her clothes to the women and my father's clothes to the men, and they were telling us stories, and I remember hiding behind the sofa, listening to the horrors of this, of this whole thing, and they were, they were telling stories, absolute nightmarish stories, and I, I wasn't supposed to hear it, and I started getting very frightened for my dad. I thought, oh no, what, what have they done to my daddy? Where's daddy? And the last day we stood there again, on the, on the, last, the, the last train coming in, and we held up the picture, and there was no daddy, and then a man came up to my mother and said, don't wait for him, he's dead. And she says, what do you mean he's dead? I saw him, he died. Well, how did he die? Never mind, he's dead, don't wait for him. And she said to him, well, who are you anyway? And he says, don't you recognize me? He happened to be a very dear friend of the family who had a big hotel casino in town where my parents used to go and play cards. And he was a friend. And she didn't recognize him, he was in such bad shape. He had played the violin, and when the commander in the, in the camp found out, they broke all his fingers, and he had hands like claws, and he frightened me. And he came home with us, and he told us about his daughter called Dita, who was 11 years old. He told us when he and his wife and his child were taken to Auschwitz, they got to the railway station in Auschwitz, they got off the train, and they automatically sent his wife and child to one side, and him to the other, and he said to one of the guards, where are they going? And the guard pointed to a chimney that was spewing smoke. He says, there. Of course, at that point, he didn't understand what it meant because they took them directly to the gas chambers. And this little girl, Dita, 11 years old, became almost like, like my sister because I know so much about her because this poor man, this poor broken man stayed with us and slowly, out of two broken families, we, we cobbled together another one. Although he was never my daddy, and I was never his Dita, he was my stepfather, and I was his stepdaughter. 
and I know so much about this little girl. One of the schools I went to uh, did a wonderful thing. It was in eighth grade, and they asked for a picture, and they printed 500 copies of her picture with her story on the back, and they sent it to 500 middle schools so that people wouldn't forget her. They called it the Dita Project. And I go to some schools and I see her picture in the library and I really choke up because I think this is wonderful. And this little girl, when I'm gone, will still be remembered because some of you people have it in your library, so she will not die completely. And then my stepfather told me how my father died. He was, he witnessed it. We never told my mother. My father and another person from his town stole a piece of bread because they were starving and they were caught. And the commander decided to make an example of them. So they took the two men and they stripped them naked and it was cold and they beat them half to death with big sticks and rods of iron. And they broke all their bones and put each of them in a dog kennel in this big field where all the prisoners would line up every morning to be counted. It's called the Appelplatz. And it took my father two days and a night to die. And when I heard this, I was about six, six and a half. When I heard this, I became very bitter and I wanted revenge. My heart was filled with so much hatred. All I could think of is what I would do to these people who killed my father. I would flay them alive. I, I devised all kinds of tortures. And I had this, this, this passion of wanting to kill, to, to get revenge, to hurt somebody. And you know, it took me 50 years to stop hating. I don't hate. I, I emptied my soul of hatred because when your heart is full of hatred, there's no room for anything else. And it was a long process, but I managed to, to wean myself away from hating. I still have sorrow. I don't forgive because I can't forgive somebody else's death, but I have no hatred. And I filled my, my, my soul with love. And I find that this is the only way to survive if anything like that happens to you. You cannot, you cannot hate, you cannot revenge. You have to keep going. I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor because I am doing something about it. I'm not just going to stay and, and hate for the rest of my life. And I do miss my father. I miss the fact that I don't have a grave to go to, you know, I have no closure. I've not, I, for years, I didn't believe he was dead. Every time I saw an old beggar, I would look into his face and think, maybe my father isn't dead. Maybe he just forgot us. Maybe, maybe his memory was gone. It was very hard for me not to have somewhere to grieve. And you know, I, I speak for the dead because they can't speak for themselves. But I'm a very, very happy, fortunate person, and I have a wonderful multicultural family. I have four sons, and you know, every time I gave birth to one of them, I was giving the finger to Hitler. <laughs> and so I have four sons, and I have four granddaughters, and they range from half Chinese, half African American, half Mexican, and even a half German. I even have one of those. And when I held that little girl in my arms, who is basically the granddaughter of a German soldier and my father, the tears were just streaming down my face because this is how it should be. We have to, we have to go forward. That closed the circle for me. The hatred is not acceptable. We, we must love each other. And I speak against scapegoating and I speak against Prejudice, I'm frightened of prejudice. I've seen what it can do. I, I, it has such awful consequences. You see, you have to think, who is the other in your life? We each have somebody other, you know. Could it be a, a Muslim? Could it be, could it be a black person? Could it be a gay person? Could it be somebody you just don't like? The other. 
and you have to stop othering people because everybody has the same, the same, the same feelings as you. And what you can do, because prejudice takes so many different forms, what you can do is do one good little thing every day if you can. I was listening to a documentary about a man who was actually the, the person who uh, was in the Nuremberg trials. He was the judge, well not the judge, he was a prosecutor. He's very old now, he's over 100, and he was talking about his parents who were immigrants. And his father would sit him down at the table at night and say to him and his sister when they were little, so what have you done for humanity today? And I know it sounds big, you know, when I say to you, please do something for humanity. People say to me, well, what can I do? You can, everybody can do something. You can do something small. Go and talk to that kid that nobody wants to talk to. Stop bullying. Help somebody across the road. Do something for someone else. Because ultimately, we're all connected. We're all our brother's keepers. We can't help it. In your generation, I absolutely agree with the governor. The other one is screwed up, but your generation is great. Because I talk to you people, and I feel so much compassion and love coming. It's such a healing thing for me. And you guys are different. You, you, you're not prejudiced. You don't care if somebody's blue, green, yellow, gay, straight. You don't seem to be so prejudiced at all. And it's up to you, because you can change this world. And you know, there's, the power of education is very strong. And that's why, you know, I think the more you know, the less prejudice you become. Because if you fear the other because you don't know the other, it becomes an enemy. And the power of one is amazing. I mean, just look at this one woman who saved me, saved my four sons, my four granddaughters, and a whole generation of people. One good deed. One do good deed, what it can do. And one small good deed can do an awful lot for everybody. And I truly believe that you guys will change the world. I would just like to close with a quote from Winston Churchill. He said during the World War, he said, and I'm, I'm reading this because it's kind of proper English, okay. Hear this, young men and women everywhere, and proclaim far and wide, the earth is yours and the fullness thereof. Be kind, but be fierce. You are needed now more than ever before. Take up the mantle of change, for this is your time. Thank you. Go change the world. Thank you. Um, I would, so what we're going to do is, if, if folks have, um, everyone can take something different from that, right? There's so many different pieces you can take from, from that story and, and Katya's experience. Um, gratitude, being grateful for everything, right? Working through, I mean, talking about working through something and, and, and finding a light at the end of the tunnel. But what we can do, we have a little extra time, and, and we're happy. Will you take a few questions? Absolutely. People, so if, if you guys have I have, any questions I have no at all. filters. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think the governor does either. I don't either, no, <laughs> unfortunately. That's good. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we have, we have a microphone. Great. So, um, did you, so you had, um, do you know about Hitler? Like, have you met him in person? No, thank God I have not met Hitler in person. Or any um, German Nazis? No, I've never met a German Nazi. It's amazing. The Hungarians did it all for me. They collaborated. I always found that to be an amazing part of the it's story. It's awful. Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> oh, stand up. Oh, sorry. Where is she? Where is she? Where is she? Oh. Hi. Okay. Don't. I to, oh, cool. Um. So, what's your nationality again? Are you Hungarian? Well, I'm sort of international. I'm American, really. I'm from Barnstead, oh. <laughs> but I was born in, in Transylvania, which it was Hungary, and now it's Romania. They keep changing it. Oh. 
Uh, yeah, I have a question. I was wondering, um, I watched a movie recently called The Schindler's List, and I was wondering if you actually ever met Schindler? No, I have not, but I went to see Schindler's List, and you know the little girl with the, with the red coat? And I remember when I saw that coat, I was thinking of my blue coat and the star, and I had to leave the, the movie, and I had to go into the ladies' room and cry. And the woman came in and said, why are you crying? I said, I'm the little girl in the coat. And she looked at me funny. It occasionally does get to me. No, I did not meet Schindler. He was a hero. What about the boy in the striped pajamas? Have you heard of that? Uh, I thought that was a little bit uh, optimistic for those times. It wouldn't have happened like that. I don't believe it. I'm sorry. I, I thought it was a very nice cinematic thing, but it was a bit far-fetched. <laughs> what did he say? Uh, Anne Frank. Anne Frank? Yeah. What about Anne Frank? Oh my God. Yes, yeah. and that's a true one. Yeah. Um, what kept you strong, and what was your motivation to keep fighting throughout this, like throughout all the tragedy you went through? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> what made me strong was the first question. And what made me fight? Uh, what made me strong? First of all, fear made me strong because fear is an incredible incentive to stay alive. And then when they tried to kill me, I got very angry. And anger helped me a lot. I, I managed to be angry and be use the anger as a, as a healing thing, because I had to fight. And also, because everybody else was dead, I had to prove that it was worth living. And you know, when, when you're a survivor, you tend to be a nasty little overachiever, which I was all my life. But, but you know, I, it, it makes you want to do something. And also, I didn't, I didn't want all those people to die without somebody witnessing them. I had to tell the world about it. Hi, so um, you were in hiding for like quite some time. What did you actually do to pass time in the barn? Oh, well, I, I, I made little dolls out of the hay, you know, little straw dolls because I couldn't have toys there. She was afraid that somebody would find out. And then I would play with the spiders. Eventually I got friendly with the spiders and I actually caught one. And I tied a string on his leg and he became my pet, big black <laughs> spider. And then the leg came off. <laughs> That's the kind of thing I did up there for three months, yes. Tried to catch mice, but they were too fast for me. Hi, this uh, jacket I'm wearing is from my grandpa who worked with the Miami Air Force. He rode a B-17. Wow. And I was wondering if he used to meet with some Jewish people that would come on boats, and I was wondering, by any chance, do you, have you ever met a U.S. soldier? Oh, yes. I've met several. I've met lots of them in my hometown. You know, when I first moved to Barnsley, there were still a lot of veterans. Unfortunately, there's less every year. And some of them were actually people who liberated camps. And, you know, they couldn't talk about it. That generation didn't talk very much about it. And my parents' generation didn't talk very much about it. It took another generation of people to be able to talk. But those were my heroes. If it wasn't for the Americans, I wouldn't be here today. Hi. <laughs> I just wanted to say that out of everything that you've been through and your attitude on it, it's just incredibly inspirational. Was there any defining moment where you felt that it wasn't worth putting all this hate in your heart? Uh, any moment that you like dropped all of it? Any specific moment? Any moment that I'm, uh, that I'm grateful to be around? Is that no, the, like you said that you lived almost 50 years with hate oh, in yeah. your heart. Uh, there was what one moment actually, I was about, oh, I would say about eight or nine, 
and I was going to school. By this time, it was Romania, and all the kids hated me because the Romanians hated me because I was Hungarian. The Hungarians hated me because I could speak Romanian, and they all hated me because I was a smart aleck. I knew everything, and I had long braids, and one of them cut one of my braids off, and I was going home with my cut off braid in my hand, crying. And I was walking down the street and an old man came up to me. I never saw him before or after. And he said, little girl, stop crying. Your hair will grow back. There's nothing wrong with your hair. You'll be very pretty again. And don't let those people make you cry because the minute you, you know that, that they hurt you and you cry, they win. What you have to do is not let them win. Don't let the bully win. If you give in to the bully, you become a victim. Don't do it. And that kind of switched. It's true. Uh, how long did you stay in Romania, Hungary after? I stayed till I was about 11. And then we emigrated to Israel, and I've lived in several other countries since I've lived in many countries. Would you say you suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder? And if you did, how did you get past it? Say that again, please. Would you say you suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder? And if you did, did you ever get past it? I don't know if, if I could quantify it like that. The only time I had a flashback is I was speaking at uh, the w World War II Museum in Wolfboro, and during the break, I went out and looked at their exhibits, and there was a bayonet in one of the glass cases. And I remember hyperventilating, having to go into the bathroom and sitting down, and I almost fainted. It, it was a panic. But that's the only thing I can remember as really very strong. So I'm not that great with words, honestly. But Go ahead. I appreciate you sharing this story with us. Can I give you a hug? Of course you can give me a hug. <laughs> of course you can give me a hug. <laughs> generation you guys are. I mean, you know, I go to schools, I get hugged by people, even boys. I mean, people my age pay for that, and I get it for free. <laughs> yes. After the war, did you notice a decline in anti-Semitism in Romania or Hungary or any other places that you travel? A decline in what? Anti-Semitism. Uh, it was kind of muted, you know, uh, instead of hating the Jews, everybody hated the communists. You know, there was a new one to hate. <laughs> and quite rightly, they were pretty awful, the communists, you know. They weren't, they weren't very nice. But the anti-Semitism was, you know, there were no more Jews left. And so there was no reason to hate Jews as much, but they, they pick on the, on the gypsies, on the Roma. Even now, they're horrible to the, to the Roma, and they have no one to defend them. Especially in Hungary, they're treating them terribly. Today. It's not good. This is why I like living here, because, you know, imagine that you live in a country where you can stand up and say, say things. I, I could say bad things about the governor, and I wouldn't be shot. <laughs> right? <laughs> Actually, he's very nice, but, it, but I could. I mean, just think of, of, of that kind of freedom that we have. Um, how long did it take you to lose the hate, the hatred that you had, and how did you like um, lose it, I guess? It was a gradual thing, because I was very fortunate. I met lots of good people in my life. Because most people, if you reach out to them, are good. If you reach out to people and ask for help, people tend to own the, the advice they give you. If you say, how can you help me do this? And you follow some of the advice, they, they own that and they want to help you. And people have been incredibly kind to me. And I've been very, very, very fortunate. I've had, I have wonderful successes in my life. But you know, I've never been happier than now because I feel now 
I have thought, I, that what I'm doing now has more meaning because I'm connecting with the whole generation now and this has incredible, incredibly empowering, wonderful things for me. And the other thing is that, you know, I feel that there is such hope. I'm, I'm very optimistic about the next, ne the next 10, 20 years. Unfortunately, I won't be here. Just remember that I told you you would change the world, okay? Um, hi. So um, I was just wondering when you started um, sharing your story. Uh, about six years ago, I had a grandchild in a school in Manchester, and she told me that uh, her class didn't know very much about, she was an eighth grader, didn't know very much about um, the Holocaust, and would I come and speak to her class? And I was very worried because I thought, you know, I've never done that before. And I went there, and I was hoping she wouldn't be ashamed of grandma. And it was wonderful. It was a love fest, and I got hooked. I, I used to talk to AIDS grade all the time, but now I've, I've, I've gone further. I've, I speak to everybody. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your story today. Um, as the years pass by and in the future we may not have many Holocaust survivors left, what, uh, um, how do you think that our generation should keep this alive and how we should remember what happened and how to stop history from rewriting itself again? Ah, oh, that's a big question. <laughs> Ooh. I'm, I'm not an educator, but I think the more, the, more, the, more, the more you read about it and the more you know about it and the more you talk to people, talk to people like me, talk to other people, there's other genocides going on today, you know. Talk to someone from Darfur or somebody from Syria. You can get, these, you can get the, this information from so many people and it won't happen again. The more you know, the less it will happen. And don't other people. Hi. Um, so, I, I'm in high school, and you've, you've obviously gone through really hard times, and I was wondering, what, how do you stay optimistic and how do you stay like and how do you keep the courage to keep going when times seem really rough because like I've been stressed and like we, haven't we all been stressed like it's high school come on but like I I just want to know like how do you find how do you find the stamina to keep going well right now my stamina comes from you guys every time I speak at one of these wonderful assemblies I go home and I'm high for two days I don't need drugs <laughs> It, it's other people that help you. It's the human connection. Try to love, you know, if you can love each other, even, even on, a, on, a, on a short time, you can love anybody for an hour. Even people you don't like, you can be nice to for an hour. It really works. It comes back. It's wonderful. Uh, hello. Uh, this is weird. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you get used to this. If there's one thing you could change about the world nowadays, what would it be? I would uh, get politicians off the television. <laughs> Respectable. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yes. That's why I love you. That's why I love you. That's exactly the answer. You're, you're going to the president. You know that. <laughs> I, will, I will campaign for you. <laughs> We're not, we're not on the mic. <laughs> you said that you felt our generation is more loving and accepting than ones in the past. What do you think is the most important thing that we as a generation can do to make sure that we keep this going and that there's nothing like this could ever happen again? I think a dialogue between you and I think knowing each other and again accepting each other and knowing each other's histories and accepting the fact that the guy next door see, eats different smelly food and that he looks different. It's accepting the other that will help you. And your generation is already there, halfway there. You're not going to let this, this happen again. Also, remember, America is, there's a big difference between Europe and America. 
America is not tribal. Europe is tribal. Everybody in my hometown was Hungarian. So all the Hungarians united against the Jews. In America, there's so many people. Everybody comes from somewhere else. It's going to be very hard to get a whole nation to rise up against one, one minority. It won't happen. You guys won't let it happen. It's true. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to upstage you here. Hi, so I've heard you speak before. I went to Elm Street Middle School, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, where else do you go to like talk to schools? Like, Do you stay in New Hampshire, or do you go other places? I tend to stay in New Hampshire and Maine because of my age. I'm a bit too old to go too far. But I have been to New York, and I'm going to down to Florida to talk. Usually, when something bad happens in a school, I reach out to the school, and I offer to come and talk to them. And you know, sometimes it works. And there's one school, unfortunately, in New Hampshire that is in a town, I'm not going to mention the town, and during the Holocaust there was a, a, a Catholic school there and the priest was so anti-Semitic that eventually I think he got excommunicated, if I'm not mistaken, and that school still exists. And I wanted to go and speak there, of course they wouldn't have me, but we found out that the kids from that school, because they only have, have it up to eighth grade, they go to high school. So I went to speak in the high school, and I was loaded for bear. I thought, now I'm going to talk to those Nazis. But it was a love fest. They all came up and kissed me. So I don't know. <laughs> it's communication. Hi. Yes. Uh, so oh. I was asking if, have you ever been to Israel? Also, can I please get a picture with you? <laughs> Of course, both. Yes to both. <laughs> Can I come up right now? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can we both You're have a, a picture? You're a rock star. Yeah. You're a rock star. I'll come and come and come. <laughs> no, don't worry about that. Here, you want me to take it? Yes. You bet. Here, let's do it. question here, okay? Hi. Hi, so you said how you kind of gained your, like, power from other people and relying on them, but, like, make, making yourself to be a survivor rather than a victim is something that has to come from yourself. What kind of mindset would you need to do that? Can you repeat that? <laughs> Slowly. <laughs> okay. So, you said you relied on other people to keep you going. Yes. What, what things did you need to do personally? What did I do personally? Ambition, maybe, because I wanted to prove to the world that although I didn't die, it was worth keeping me alive. You know, I was in a Jewish kindergarten for a very short while. There were 52 kids. Only two of us survived. And I met the other woman who survived. I met her years later in London, a very odd occasion. It was wonderful, and you know, I remember the joy that I had for finding somebody who actually made it, but unfortunately she passed away from cancer later. But the fact that I survived made me very ambitious because I felt that I had to do it for the others. They couldn't, you know, little Dita couldn't do it. She, she couldn't have a life. So I had to live double, triple, quadruple lives for everybody. Ambition, I have a tremendous, and even now, look, I'm 81, I'm still here. And I'm not about to stop. I'll speak as long as I have a voice. Thank you. Okay, I think we can go home. <laughs> Hold on. Be before we uh, before we send Kati off and, and give her a big thank you, um, I just I want to say a few things. I, first off, the the presentation here is always incredible, and the the questions are always incredible. It's so incumbent upon us to be able to listen, right? Because again, making that connection. And to talk to a few things that were addressed here, you know, times get tough. Times get really, really tough. And there can be a, a, a moment 
It can be a day, it can be a week, it can be a year. And going to one of the questions that I heard out there, you know, how do you do it? How do you keep going past those tough times? You always have to find something that grounds you. Mm -hmm. It's different. It could be family, it could be faith, it could be your art, it could be a something. Dog. It could be your dog, right? It could be anything. But it has to be what's for you. It's not for anyone to tell you how to get through that. You've got to find that. But there's something out there. There's doors of opportunity for that grounding every, everywhere. And again, I, for me, you've got to find what you take out of, to, out of today. Today can't be one day. This cannot be about a single presentation. We heard this amazing story, and then we go out. The whole point of this is what do we do the other 364 days of the year, right? How do we take this and incorporate this into our lives? How do we practice empathy? How do we look for those, those moments of gratitude? And gratitude can be what is about the next day, the opportunity for a new day and getting through something. Gratitude can be something right in front of us. Gratitude can be the smell of an orange. Mm -hmm. Think about that. So again, it's all about the individual and finding that path. Right? There's opportunity for everyone. There's hope for a lot of really, really tough times. Um, and again, what we take from this today and how we carry that, that's the most important part of all of this. What we're going to do to take out of this. Cannot thank you enough, Kati. Thank you. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.